These stories take place in the summers of 2004 and 2006. James enjoys storytelling these stories when the mood is right. However, he is always still a bit hesitant to tell people. He knows these stories are not considered a grand encounter, but believes they go beyond what most normal people experience. They are also encounters that he experienced while others were present. Just to give you a bit of context and description of where he used to live, this all takes place in a lake right around the center of the country, just between the capital and a larger lake. It is very tourist heavy in the summer. James's dad was in the military and used to work at a nearby military airport back in the socialist times. By the way, this is in Hungary. He used to live in a small town on the shore of the lake, at the very edge of the settlement. At the time, it only had a small line of trees, farmland, and fruit orchards that went on for miles behind his house. This area is also directly below an extremely busy air traffic corridor, and James inherited a love for aviation from his father. As such, he is relatively confident in identifying most aircraft. There were already strange stories of lights in the area that he had heard from his grandparents, but most could be written off as drunken hallucinations. The first encounter he will be sharing happened in early midsummer of 2004. This happened to be the night of a concert for an 80s rock band held annually in town. It draws most of the locals to a lake shore on the north side of town. Heavy rain earlier in the evening had cleared up by the time darkness had settled in. However, the air was still extremely damp. Although the asphalt on the streets bathed in the continuous summer heat that was already dry. James was hanging out with three of his friends at the local food and drink near the store, and this is the only place that's open during the summer. As the concert was getting closer and more and more people showed up, the surrounding stores became very noisy, so they decided to head home. They also made sure to see the two ladies in the group home first. They were staying at the same house. Since they had a good conversation going, when they got there, they decided to sit on the driveway that faced a semicircle facing east and continue to chat. Thankfully, after the rain, the temperature became quite comfortable. Additionally, the dead silence of the empty streets in the middle of town, with only some notes of the concert making it to them, was very alluring as teenagers. James was on one end facing south, with one of the girls sitting across from him facing north. And as they chatted away, he suddenly saw the girl across from him completely freeze up. Her pupils grew massive, and she pointed behind him, but when he turned around, he saw something he could only describe as strange. They could see an object floating midair about two or three houses up the street from them. Its shape was hard to make out as it was glowing bright with a yellowish white color, similar to the color light old light bulbs used to make. From where they sat, it was at least the size of a basketball, but they did not make much time to observe it as it was moving. Its movement was a bit like an insect or like a ball riding on the waves of the sea. Not straight, but bobbing slightly as it moved forward in a not hurried pace from west to east. It flew above the street about two or three meters above ground before disappearing between the houses on the other side. James' friend looked at him with a crap-eating grin and asked, What do you think that was? Looking over at the girl who spotted this thing initially, still in distress, replied, Whatever you believe it to be. The girl then opened her mouth and kept saying, Firefly, 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 repeatedly. We stuck around a bit until she calmed down and went home. Nothing else happened that night. Now fast forward two years in August of 2008. James had graduated, gotten a car, and loved driving around at night, becoming the quasi-taxi service for his group of friends. This occurred again on the night when it was raining in the evening, but cleared up later, sometime after 10 p.m. once darkness had completely set in. One of his friends was messing around with a skateboard, somebody else brought along in a gravel parking area, and it went as well as you might expect. His friend's arm was bleeding. He had scraped it quite deep. Deep, but not bad enough to need a doctor. Since he was in his mid-twenties at this point, he did not want to go home to let his parents know out of sheer embarrassment. He and James decided to drive him to the other end of the small town just a few minutes away, and James would treat the wound. 
As previously mentioned, James's childhood home was facing the south with nothing but a few lines of trees separating the family home from large swaths of uninhibited areas with nothing but fruit orchards and grain fields. They had a large porch overseeing a Y-shaped intersection on the other side of a small open green area where there were two major roads of the town combined and continued towards the south with one lonely street lamp marking the end of the inhabited area. His friend waited for him in the car while James got everything he needed from the house. As he stepped out on the porch, he saw the same type of orb as before, but it wasn't alone this time. About 20 or 30 of them flew above the road heading south. According to the Google Maps measuring tool, he observed these things from about 70 meters away. Their movement was the same as the previous, almost a swimming motion, like the one he had seen two years prior, but what was even stranger was how they moved together. These things did not fly in formation as you'd see with birds or planes. They kept their distance from each other, but almost as if they were playing. Some would start flying circles around others while they all moved along. James's friend only noticed them after he saw James standing frozen on the porch, his friend sank into the seat to hide, and James yelled for his dad, who came out, looked at them, and asked him, what do you expect me to do about them? Went back inside and started watching TV. James tried taking a picture with his phone, which had a 640x480 camera, before they disappeared behind the trees following the road. Because of the street lamp and the distance, the only visible thing was the light from the lamp. You wonder why James did not follow these as they flew along the road, but in both situations, his mind seemed to default to how you might behave if you had observed an insect that might sting you. His reasoning was screaming at him that he was seeing something that definitely should not be seen. Going after them, out into the fields was definitely out of the question. So, if you'd ever find yourself in the area on a clear summer evening after a storm, be sure to look up you might see something extraordinary. Dale is in his mid-50s now and works in the IT field. However, when he first graduated from college, he studied to be a Roman Catholic priest. He was a seminarian with a Midwestern diocese for five years, but left seminary studies before being eligible for ordination. The diocese he studied before was very rural and missionary meaning it had a very small per capita Roman Catholic population as compared to a Providence or Boston or New York or Chicago. When he was a seminarian with the diocese and was home for summer or winter break, he would regularly visit an older priest friend of his who parish was in a small rural town that bordered a Native American reservation. It was not in the reservation boundary, but bordered it. He was a dear friend and mentor during Dale's seminary years. During his first visit to his parish, they prepared dinner, a nice roast beef with salad. It was a Sunday evening and he had the day off on Monday. The parish phone rang as they were preparing dinner and the friend had asked Dale to answer it. He answered and a frantic woman on the line wanted a priest to come and exercise her apartment now because her daughter's boyfriend had visited the night before and had been acting strangely. The family ended up having to call the police because he became uncharacteristically violent and threatening to him. This caller was Native American and felt a spirit had come over him. The police took him away and he was checked into the mental ward of a local hospital. She said the apartment didn't feel the same since he had entered it that day before. She felt darkness and evil, and so did her teenage daughter. Dale explained that the priest was unavailable, but that he would take a message and get to it to the priest. The priest was in the background listening and motioning that he was unavailable. So Dale did his best to calm and console the woman and try to get her to relax. But no matter how much he explained that one does not exercise a place or an object, but a person, and that one could have a priest come and bless her apartment, an exorcism wasn't really called for. When Dale hung up the phone, the priest said to him, I've been a priest for over 35 years and I have never, I mean never gotten a phone call like that. I'm glad you answered the phone. The two men didn't think anything of it. They enjoyed a most wonderful dinner and visit that evening. 
Dale stayed over in the guest room, and they got up the next day, and Dale headed back to the parish he was assigned to stay at that summer, about an hour and a half drive away. After a few weeks, his priest friend invited Dale to his parish on a Saturday night. He wanted Dale to talk about the Diocesan Seminary program for young men at the Saturday Vigil Mass and again at Sunday Morning Mass the next day. Rural parishes like his know the diocese has seminarians studying to be a priest and get ordained but rarely have the opportunity to meet seminarian young men. So Dale agreed to come and speak. He arrived without issues and gave his talk at the Saturday Vigil Mass. After Mass, they returned to the rectory, which is the house where the priest lives at a parish, to make dinner and visit. They no sooner stopped in the door than the parish phone rang. It had been a long day for Dale's friend and bearing an emergency call for the parishioner. He wasn't going to answer it. He asked Dale again to answer it and explain he wasn't available but could take a message. Dale answered it and a teenage boy said, I need a priest to come quick and perform an exorcism. My girlfriend and I had been playing with the Ouija board and the house is possessed. Dale explained that he was not a priest and that the priest was unavailable, but he could take a message. The young man left his name and phone number, and when Dale told the priest what the caller had said, he looked at him oddly and said, That's the second time I've ever gotten a call like that, both times he were visiting. Coincidence? Then he smiled and they merely laughed it off. The summer came and went, and Dale was about to head back to seminary, six hours away by car in a neighboring state. They made plans for him to drop by his parish once again, spend the night, have dinner, and visit on his way back to seminary to start the fall semester of his second year of studies. On Dale's next visit, he arrived at about 4 p.m. They had gone shopping in the closest town, about 30 or so minutes away from the parish, to get the items for dinner. When they returned, the priest went to the church to meet with a parishioner coming by for only counseling. Dale decided to lie down in the guest room and take a nap. The priest returned to the rectory at about 6.30 p.m. and began prepping dinner. Dale awoke from his nap, entered the kitchen, and sat down on a bar stool at the counter to visit and talk while his friend prepared dinner. He didn't need Dale's help this time. The phone rang, and the priest was about to answer it when he remembered Dale's previous visits and said, Why don't you answer it? Is that okay? If it's a parishioner, I'll take it. Dale answered the phone, greeting the caller with the parish name, and asked how he could help. The caller on the other end of the phone was an older gentleman, and he introduced himself by saying, I'm not Catholic, and I'm sorry to bother you. However, my son was out with some friends of his last night, and I think they're all never-do-wells, and he's been acting oddly all day long. I do not know what they did or where they went, but he did not return until early this morning, and ever since then he's just been odd. I think he may be possessed. Is the priest available? Dale put him on hold and told his friend what the caller was asking for. Once again, the priest asked him to take a message. When Dale hung up, his friend couldn't help but say, I don't know what it is about you and the things or energies or spirits you stir up when you come to town, but every time you visit, we get a call like that. In all my years of priestly ministry at a parish, I have never, I repeat, never received any calls remotely associated to possession or paranormal activity. Dale replied, I don't know what it is either. I can't help it, but are you going to call him back? The priest said, hell no. No priest wants to deal with anything like that. Even the diocese exorcism won't touch situations like that lightly. It is unclear if it is still the case with so many Roman Catholic priests on these paranormal ghost hunting shows claiming to be an exorcist. Still, when Dale was in seminary, each diocese had one priest designated as the exorcist, and only that priest and the bishop knew who the exorcist was. The bishop would select one priest known for his sanctity and dedication of prayer and holiness to be the top diocese. The bishop had made an appointment that priest publicized, and neither did the bishop. The nature of demonic energy, or spiritual negative energy, kind of explains why that is the case. If one freely hung up a shingle saying, I'm the diocesan exorcist, then that might give the demonic negative spiritual energy the upper hand. Dale indeed never claimed to be an exorcist. 
He wasn't even a priest yet. Dale is just less than one-eighth blood of Native American tribe whose reservation bordered the parish boundaries. But he had no explanation for the calls this parish priest would receive when he visited town. During that year of studies, the bishop reassigned his priest friend to a different parish, so he never had an opportunity to visit his parish friend again. Dale would leave his Roman Catholic seminary studies and move out east. He is still Catholic, just no longer Roman Catholic. To this day, Dale does not know why his presence at the parish in that town stirred up such weird calls. The priest had never received calls like this in his 35 years of priestly ministry. Dale believes in the paranormal. As a worker, independent priest, should someone ever need assistance in that area, meaning more in the blessing of the house and not possession, he would gladly offer his services. He says he is happy to work with people whose houses are haunted. Next, we have two stories from Ben. The first comes from a close family member of his. Back in the summer of 2021, his close family member and three of their university friends went on a hiking trip at the Rimwall Summit in Alberta. It is extremely important to note that it was very hot that day. About 86 degrees Fahrenheit, or for you Celsius lovers, about 30 degrees Celsius. You needed to have ample water and keep up in the shade to reduce the risk of heat stroke. Besides the heat, it was a really nice day for the hike, so as long as you stay in the shade. So his family member and their three friends arrived at the base of the trail. However, there are two trails for the path they planned. One for the Rimwell Summit and another for a different summit. They actually took the wrong path and ended up on the Rimwall Summit hike which turned out to be much more challenging than the one they had originally wanted to do. They continued on the wrong path for a while and were getting worried they went the wrong way. The hike was much harder than they had anticipated. The hike that they had intended to do was easy, but they decided to commit to the hike because they were too far to turn back. They then made their way further up the trail and saw a strange figure standing on the side. His family member and their friends immediately noticed that this figure was dressed in a thick black puffy winter jacket with their hood up, long black pants, and hiking boots. The trail was wide, and this strange average adult-sized person was standing 20 feet off the trail in an intermediary shaded area. They could not get a good look at the figure's face because their winter hood was cinched up and they were standing far off the trail. This was strange because it was extremely hot outside and the figure had no backpack or any signs of carrying water on them. They cautiously approached the figure and asked if they were okay. The figure, standing eerily still, replied in a monotone voice, Yes. They were all taken aback by the figure's blunt reply. Then they had asked, Are we on the right path? The figure replied in the same monotone voice, Yes. Yes. They weren't, but were too freaked out to press the issue further. All they knew was that they needed to get out of there, and the figure seemed fine. They thanked the strange person and continued on their hike. They enjoyed the hike despite going up the wrong path and experiencing that strange encounter. The view was amazing at the summit, though, and the hike was much easier coming back down. The peculiar figure dressed in all black and a winter coat was also gone and all of them were still a bit shaken by that strange encounter. Ben's family member claims that it might have been a ghost of somebody who died in the winter on this summit because of their winter attire, the strange way the figure talked and appeared on the path. Also, they were not too sure about the gender, as most of their body was covered and their hood hid their face, but they do claim the voice sounded somewhat feminine. But Ben also believes it might have been a ghost, but what do you think? Ben's next story takes place in 2009, and he could still remember it vividly as if it were yesterday. Ben was at home and woke up in the middle of the night for no apparent reason at first. You see, he is a light sleeper and has the uncanny ability to wake up before somebody comes home or before they have visitors of some kind. Well, on this particular warm and pleasant night, they did have visitors. Ben was awake and lying in bed with his head near the window above him and to his left. Nothing seemed off until there was a loud noise. It was like a loud hum of huge machinery, and he could feel the noise passing through his body. And then there was a bright light that followed suit. The noise and light got louder and brighter, and he became paralyzed in fear and forgot to breathe. 
He knew he was awake because it felt real, like really real. The fear and the sensation of pure terror skyrocketed up and ran through his body. His instincts told him to keep still and to not look out his window. Good thing he listened because as suddenly as the noise and light came, it all vanished and he was okay. He decided to go back to sleep and did not dare look out his window until he woke up again when the sun was up and had to get ready for school. Nothing was there. He did ask his mother, who was in her bedroom beside him, if she heard or saw anything weird last night, and she said no. She slept through that noise and light. But Ben knew it was not a dream because that same day he was walking home from school and he saw a white unmarked van and a guy standing beside it with a strange apparatus. He thinks it was a black sphere of some kind on a tripod and remembers that it was really weird. Maybe that guy was searching for UFO activity. Ben isn't sure, but it was too strange for that to happen. And then this guy shows up near his house with a strange looking device and an unmarked white van with no windows. Ben did not even think about approaching him to ask him what he was doing or what he was up to. But again, his instincts told him, stay quiet, look ahead, keep walking, get home now. The guy was there for a few days and then he was gone. And all Ben can think about is that he is glad he kept his head down and stayed quiet. Because even to this day, he shudders to have think what would have happened if he had not listened to his instincts. And he knows it wasn't all a dream. It all felt too real and that the guy showed up right after that van and strange equipment. Too strange. Nothing strange happened again or after that, and he is grateful for all that is, but it's still puzzling to this day what could have been. But more importantly, what do you guys think? Are these stories merely just tales of misidentification and possibly hallucination or psychosis? Or are these true and genuine encounters with things we cannot explain? I'll let you guys be the judge. Be sure to let me know what you think in the comments down below. And as always, if you're new to the channel, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. I love you all. Keep an open mind. And I'll check you guys in the very next episode.